Alright, you all have been waiting for this video for such a long time. Today, I'm going to be beating King Dice, the Devil, and the entire Cuphead DLC on Expert Mode, but every single boss has 10 times HP. So, for a bit of backstory, this mod started off as a joke on one of my streams, and then it just became another one of my bad ideas. So, for some reason, I decided to actually create it with the help of GOTGM on YouTube, and it is, yeah, it's definitely one of the worst ideas I've ever had. So, just for some basic rules, I started on a new save file and just used the expert mode glitch to get expert mode early. And for this video, I need to beat King Dice, the Devil, and the entire DLC, obviously on expert mode and with the mod on. If you've somehow lost more brain cells than me and you think it's a good idea to try out this mod, you can go to the link down below in the description to download and play the mod. And finally, if you have not seen the videos for Inkwell Isle 1, Inkwell Isle 2, and Inkwell Isle 3, they are required to watch after this video because of the, the lore. I don't know. And if you want, comment down below any other challenges you want to see me do. There aren't any left, trust me, but you know, go ahead. So without further ado, let's just get straight into this challenge. Alright, it is time to fight everybody's favorite Cuphead Dad, King Dice. For those of you who don't know how this boss fight works, I'm going to quickly explain it. As you can see, there is a massive game board displayed out in front of us with tiles on it. These tiles consist of five different things. Numbered tiles from 1 to 9, 3 safe tiles, and a start, start over, and finish tile. The numbered tiles relate to all 9 of King Dice's mini bosses, and whichever one we land on correlates to the one we have to fight. If you look closely, you might also see that some of the numbered tiles have a heart above them. This is just to represent if we land on this tile, we will also get an extra HP. The safe tiles act as, you know, a safe tile. We don't have to fight any mini bosses and we can stay on that piece. The start tile is obviously where we start and the start over tile obviously puts us back at the beginning. And finally, the finish tile engages the boss fight with King Dice. If you're wondering how we move from tile to tile, King Dice is nice enough to place down a dice that just defies the laws of cube. Somehow, not including the top and bottom, this dice ranges from 1 to 3. But anyways, all we have to do is parry the dice, and whichever number we land on is how many times we're gonna move on the board. So, in the original stream, I only did the three necessary bosses to make it to King Dice and finish the boss fight. But a while after, I remembered that I'm not a big baby and I'm actually the god of Cuphead, so I decided to do the entire thing while beating every single mini boss. I'm not gonna be able to go into extreme detail with every single mini boss because there's literally 10 of them, but I'll try my best, starting with the Tipsy Troop. This boss fight consists of three different bosses Rumulus, Ol' Ethan, and Jeanette. These three bosses have separate hitboxes, health bars, and attacks, but they all three need to be defeated before we can move on to the next mini-boss. The first of these three that we want to take out is Ol' Ethan. He's the short glass- or sorry, the short king. Whatever, it's that one. The reason why we want him gone is because his attack is extremely annoying. He only has one, but it's without a doubt the most tedious one to deal with. During this attack, Ol' Ethan falls over and spills out all the liquid inside the glass. This creates a hurt box across the entire floor and forces the player to jump. And if I have to jump, that means I have to press an extra button, and since this boss fight lasts for around 10 minutes, I'm going to be pressing that button a lot, which means Ol' Ethan is target number one. As for how exactly we're going to kill him, we're just going to take out the spread shot and stand about two inches away from his face and start shooting. After a few minutes, Ol' Ethan goes down, and now it's time to take out Rumulus. Rumulus is the big bottle standing at the back, and funny enough, his attack is very similar to Ol' Ethan's. During his attack, he shoots rum out from inside the bottle straight up into the air, and after a while, it comes back down towards the player's current location. It's pretty much just Ol' Ethan's attack, but, you know, vertical. This attack is very easy to dodge, as it doesn't require us to press any extra buttons, and it's very clearly telegraphed by this animation. To kill Romulus, we could use the exact same spread shot strategy, but it doesn't work as well since we can't get as close, so instead I'm just going to be using the roundabout. When the roundabout turns back around, it gains a little bit of height, and that height is just enough to hit the bottom of Romulus's hitbox. So it's as simple as just moving around when we see him attacking and continuously shooting our roundabout. 
And finally, with those two done, we only have one left, and that's Jeanette. She is definitely the easiest one to deal with, because much like the other two, she only has one attack, but this attack is just spawning minions. Every time she attacks, she spawns an Olive Bat, which are minions that float around at the top of the screen and shoot eyeballs at the player. Occasionally, these eyeballs can be parryable, and she can only spawn three Olive Bats at a time. So even with the max amount of minions, she's not that hard to deal with, and all we do is get as close as we can and use our spread shot. And after 7 minutes of fighting this one mini boss, we have finally finished all three, meaning we can move on to Chip's Bedigan. This mini boss also only has one attack, and it's where he floats up and travels from one side to the other, and our job is to dodge in between the poker chips. Normally if I was playing as Cuphead or Mugman, some of the patterns that the chips move across in could be quite difficult to dodge, requiring us to do some really weird movements. Although since I'm playing as Miss Chalice, this boss fight's an absolute joke. Instead of, you know, ever leaving the ground ever, I can just use Miss Chalice's invincibility roll. This is because when the player's crouched, the only chip that can actually damage them is the very bottom one. So as long as I roll when the bottom chip is moving towards me, it is physically impossible for me to take any damage. So now instead of this boss fight being difficult and extremely tedious, it's just extremely tedious. This is because the only way to damage Chip's bed again is to hit him directly in his face. And since I didn't bring a shot with aimbot like the chaser or the crack shot, and I also spent half the boss fight rolling around on the damn floor, this extends the boss fight even more, and not to mention he also has 5,750 HP, so that obviously doesn't help. But finally, after another 6 or 7 minutes, we finally say goodbye to Chip's bed again. And we say hello to our favorite giant cigar, Mr. Wheezy. Mr. Wheezy is a pretty simple boss fight. He can appear on either the left side or the right side of the screen, and once he does, he shoots out looping fireballs, and when he's finished, he teleports to the other side. And that is pretty much it for this boss fight. Fun fact, while he's doing his fireball attack, if the fireballs start their loop at the top of the circle, you can stand at the very edge of either ashtray, and it is physically impossible for the fireballs to hit you. But if we get unlucky and the fireball starts at the bottom of the circle, we can still stay in the same spot, but we have to jump. And that's it. The only real annoying thing about this mini boss is how much HP he actually has. He's actually tied for the most HP of a ground mini boss with 8,500 HP. So after standing in place and almost doing absolutely nothing for around 7 minutes straight, we are finally finished with this boss fight and on to our fourth mini boss. Our fourth mini boss is Pip and Dot. These two don't have a very complex moveset, but they're definitely way harder than the last three mini bosses. Their moveset consists of two attacks. The first attack is where they spawn a minion known as a Domino Bird. This Domino Bird flies in a backward C pattern and has 20 health, which is around 3 roundabout hits. Their second attack involves them shooting out a 20 sided die. This die can be parryable, but all it does is bounces off the top and bottom of the screen, traveling in a zigzag pattern. So I've just explained their entire moveset in about 30 seconds, so how the fuck is this mini boss any more difficult than the last three? The difficulty again comes with the longevity of this boss fight. For this fight, since I'm not consistently landing attacks, it almost lasts for 10 minutes. And to make this boss fight even worse, if you look at the floor, there are spikes there, and believe it or not, those spikes are very pointy and they hurt if you sit on them. So needless to say, after 10 minutes of straight jumping to keep myself off the floor and off the spikes, my thumb was extremely tired. My thumb hurts from pressing it to jump. Once we finish this fight, we sadly don't get a break because we are moving on to, without a doubt, the hardest mini boss in this entire fight. I am of course talking about Hoppus Pocus. Whether you're playing as Cuphead or Mugman and even Miss Chalice, this boss is always extremely annoying to deal with and I of course made it even harder. Much like Pippin Dot, Hoppus Pocus only has two attacks. The first one is the easiest one for us to deal with. When he begins the attack, he spawns a ring of rabbit skulls that spin around the player. After a while, the skulls stop spinning and they move in towards the player. But as you can see, there's a gap in the skulls closing in on us, and this gap can appear in any of the cardinal or ordinal directions. So obviously, our job is to not get crushed to death by some skulls, but this is actually really easy because we again have Miss Chalice's invincibility roll. It doesn't actually matter where the gap in the skull is, all we have to do is wait for them to start closing in and instantly roll out, and it's as simple as that. 
But now it's time for us to talk about the second attack. If we were playing as Cuphead or Mugman, this attack would be really easy to dodge, but we're obviously not, so it's the bane of my existence. During this attack, he spawns a row of 9 card suits, and on expert mode, there's one heart that spawns in the row, and that heart is parryable. After a while, he then sends this row of card suits either up or down at the player, and it's our job to parry the heart in the row to leave a gap for us to fit through. So you might be thinking to yourself, wait, why is this hard? You can just jump and parry the hole and go right through it, right? But then you remember that Miss Chalice has a dash parry, and you have to horizontally parry one specific thing in a row of 9 that is vertically moving towards you. And then you remember that he has 10 times HP, and he does this one attack like 100 different times in the one f boss fight. If the row is moving down towards the player, it can luckily be dodged by a well-timed Miss Chalice invincibility roll. But if the row is moving up towards the player, uh, you might as well just give up. And that's pretty much all I could say for this boss fight. I, I just hate it. If you want to know one more thing that sucks about it, remember when I said Mr. Wheezy was tied for the most HP of any ground mini boss? Yeah, he's the other guy. That's right, he has 8,500 HP. I don't want to be doing this anymore. Go to the next one. And guess what? Our next mini boss does not get any better because it's another arch nemesis of ours in this challenge. That's right, it's of course a plane boss. For those of you who haven't seen this series yet, the reason why plane bosses are so bad is because we can no longer use our super art. Basically, during almost every single fight in this series, I've been using Miss Chalice's Super Art 2. Miss Chalice's Super Art 2 is known as Shield Pal. This Super Art summons a floating shield, which takes an extra hit for us. Sadly, the shields can't stack, but I can try my best to always have one with me, so I can theoretically never take a hit of damage. And that sounds great, doesn't it? But the problem is, when we enter a plane level, regardless of what super art we have equipped, we will always have the nuke super. Which means now we don't have a shield to protect us from any extra damage, meaning every single hit is permanent. And keep in mind, this is only the 6th mini boss, we still have a lot more to go. So yes, this is a plane boss, meaning it's automatically pretty difficult, but then I remembered that I'm really good at this game, and it's not that bad. So there's two things we have to worry about in this boss fight. The first one is the small tiny ghosts riding skeleton horses. One thing that's completely irrelevant, but I just found out, um, these ghosts have legs. And I, I hate it. Regardless of how many appendages these ghosts have, they can be seen at the bottom of the screen. These ghosts will ride past until they're in line with the player. Once they are, they're gonna shoot off the horse in an attempt to assassinate us. So to avoid them, we just want to make sure we're moving around as much as possible, as well as paying as much attention as we can to the bottom of the screen. The second thing we have to worry about is what I like to call ribcage surprise. Every once in a while, the horse will shoot out a blue present from his ribcage. And after enough time has passed, this present will blow up into 8 different horseshoes with one of the horseshoes being parryable. As you can see, this attack is pretty simple to dodge. We just need to make sure we have a large enough gap between us and the present so that when it blows up, we don't eat any horseshoes. For anybody who cares, this mini boss's name is Fear Lab, and for a plane boss, it's not overly painful. You know, apart from the fact that he is, you know, 12,000 HP. But finally, after blowing up this skeleton horse with a nuke 16 f times, we can finally move on from this boss fight and go to our seventh mini boss. Finally, we get a break from the stupid difficulty of this challenge because we get to face Pirouetta. If I was playing as Cuphead or Mugman, this mini boss would be pretty difficult, but then again, I'm not, so I'm just gonna cheese it. You know that fancy old move I told you about? The one that only Miss Charles can do, invincibility rolling? Remember how it completely broke the Chips Bedigan boss fight? We're gonna do the same thing here. Pirouetta's first attack involves just going back and forth between the left and right side of the screen. And what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to parry these poker chips to turn them into platforms so we can jump over her. But I have an invincibility roll and I'm just going to roll through her legs and that's basically the entire boss fight. The second attack she has is where she rains down a ton of roulette balls and our job is to fit through a gap so we can avoid taking damage. But again, we can just use our invincibility roll to make our own gap and fit through wherever we want. So after an absurd amount of invincibility rolls, we finally managed to take out Pirouetta's 8,000 health, and we're on to without a doubt the easiest mini boss in this entire game. I'm of course talking about the man himself, Mangosteen. 
In this challenge, Mangosteen only has 7,500 HP, and to make this even better, he only has one attack. For this attack, he summons a devastating ball of destruction, and it just slowly moves towards the player. Much like a lot of the other attacks, this ball is just programmed to go towards the player's current location. So, once he shoots it, we can just step a few inches to the left or right, and we dodged it. Other than this, I mean, I guess he summons minions, but they're just unkillable billiard chocks that jump. So, that's the boss fight. It's literally that simple. We just sit directly underneath Magosteen and use our spread shot until he dies. Here, just to end this off, I'll give you a fun fact. Um, he was supposed to be a piece of bread. So, you know, that's cool. Whatever, that doesn't matter. We are now on to tile 9, meaning all we have to do is kill this mini boss and King Dice, and we have officially beaten the entire boss fight. So without further ado, let's get into our ninth fight against Mr. Chimes. Overall, his attacks aren't very interesting. In fact, he only has one. But it's the fight itself that's so different from every other fight in this game that makes it so perfect. As you can see right now, I can't actually damage Mr. Chimes, but if you look in the background, there's 12 different playing cards that we can parry. So you know what that means, it's time for some good old fashioned geriatric matching games. Flipping over all 12 cards, you can see that there are 6 different pairs for us to create. One Cuphead pair, one Mugman pair, two pairs with an MDHR logo, and two pairs with some dices. After parrying two matching cards, we can now damage Mr. Chimes. During this stage, Mr. Chimes also gains his one attack. He smashes his symbols together, creating six golden music notes, which then shoot off until they make it off screen. To dodge this attack, we're just gonna do the exact same thing we did to dodge the ribcage present in the fear lap fight, which is just get as far away as possible. Personally, I think Mr. Chimes is the best mini boss in this entire game, but sadly, I can't be happy about this fight because in this challenge, he has 10,000 HP and he's also a plane boss. But finally, after matching all 12 cards and finishing off Mr. Chimes, I yell bingo and slap some old ladies on my way out because I'm now going to fight King Dice. That's right, King Dice, the ultimate final mini boss of this entire fight. Um, he's easy. For this entire fight, he only does one attack. He doesn't summon anything, it's just that one attack. During this attack, he either leans to the left or to the right, and he sends out an army of 12 playing cards which walk across and take up the entire floor. So, if these cards are all across the floor, how are we supposed to not take any damage? As you can see, some of the cards are in the heart suit, and just like previous boss fights, the heart cards are obviously parryable. These heart cards also give off a parryable smoke since we're playing as Miss Chalice, so it's easier for us to parry with a dash parry. So to easily dodge this attack, all we have to do is overuse Miss Chalice's dash parry and double jump, and that's basically it. Another alternative way of dodging this is standing behind King Dice's arm, but the problem is his arm acts as an invisible wall which I can't shoot through, so this fight would take way longer if I did this strategy. That means that King Dice is probably one of the only mini bosses we didn't cheese, but finally, after taking out all of his 7,500 HP, we're done with this mini boss and completely done with the entirety of this boss fight. Could you imagine taking damage on a boss fight with 10x HP? and on expert mode. It's been over an hour and one hour, three minutes and 27 seconds. That is an S rank, ladies and gentlemen. I'm literally just the best in the entire world. And there's nothing you can say about it! There we go, we are finally done with that stupidly long boss fight. It literally took over an hour, but we are on to our next boss, which is obviously the devil. If I'm gonna be completely honest, this boss fight's not gonna be that hard. I literally have a stream where I beat this one boss 100 times in a row on expert mode without dying a single time. So I'm not gonna be talking a lot about the challenge during this boss fight, because you could say that I'm, you know, decent at this fight. Also, from now on, every single boss fight can be viewed in full if you just go to the playlist linked down below. I don't know why you would want to watch that, but I mean, you can.
But none of that is important because you are here to see me beat up a goat that is on a lot of steroids. Just as a disclaimer for the rest of this video, if you're wondering why the footage now looks like you've been punched in the eye socket by Mike Tyson, that's because YouTube streams are really hard to download without them looking like complete total ass. Regardless of that, the first phase of this boss fight is extremely complicated. In just this phase of the boss fight, he has 7,350 HP, as well as having 6 different attacks, and he spawns minions. His minions are fairly easy to deal with. On expert mode, they spawn with 5 HP, which is only 0.5 more than normal mode, so I don't know why they did that. But regardless of how much HP they have, they always get taken out by a single roundabout shot. This is actually one of the reasons why I chose the roundabout for this fight, because it basically shoots in both directions, meaning we can never get surprise attacked. As you've seen from this footage, his minions, which are purple demons, first appear behind the throne, then run towards the player from whichever side they appeared from. So if they first appear on the right side of the throne, they're gonna run towards the player from the right side, and that's the exact same for if they're on the left. So, as long as we're constantly shooting our roundabout, these minions aren't really that big of a deal since they're pretty much instantly killed. Moving on from the super tiny Grimace dudes, it's time to talk about his 6 different attacks. All of these attacks get put into 2 different categories, the first one being pitchfork attacks and the second one being transformations. The first category we're going to be talking about is the pitchfork attacks. In this category, we have three different attacks, the crystal ball, the fire wheel, and the fireballs. The crystal ball attack, or as it's known in the game files, the pitchfork four flame bouncer, is definitely the easiest of his pitchfork attacks. In this attack, he creates four randomly bouncing crystal balls, with one of them being parryable. Since we don't have to pay any attention to his minions, we can completely focus on dodging this attack. And the crystal balls move at the same speed at the same time, so you can clearly see what pattern they're taking, and you can easily just move out of the way. And also, not to mention, Miss Chalice has a double jump, so you know, that helps a bit. The second attack, the fire wheel, or as it's known in the game files, the pitchfork five flame spinner, is the complete opposite of the last attack. It is really hard. For this attack, he creates a wheel of four flames with one flame in the middle that's of course parryable. And, for some reason, not only is this mega flame death wheel spinning, but it also chases down the player. There isn't truly a good way of dodging this attack. Obviously, again, Miss Chalice's double jump does help, but much like a lot of the other attacks in this challenge, I just tried to get as far away from this thing as possible. If the flame wheel manages to make its way to me, another thing I would do is first parry the flame in the middle. And now there's open space inside the flame, so I can sit in the middle and jump over the flames that rotate towards me. So for example, if the flame wheel was moving clockwise, I would sit in the middle and do a counterclockwise arc jump to make it over the bottom flame. I don't even think there's anybody in this world who likes this attack, and if you do, then the cops are on their way. The final attack in this category is the Fireballs, also known as Pitchfork Six Flame Ring in the game's code. This attack is really simple. Six flames get spawned in a hexagon pattern, with one of them, of course, being parryable. Once all six have spawned, they each take turns shooting off towards the player's current location, and once they're all gone, that's the end of the attack. So, how exactly do we dodge this attack? We literally just move. If we stick to the floor while moving and let majority of the flames shoot towards us, we can just use Miss Chalice's double jump to clear any other flames. One cool thing about this category is there's actually two unused attacks that are completely coded in the game, they just aren't used. You can see the attacks on screen right now, the one on the left is Pitchfork 3 Flame Jumper, and the one on the right is Pitchfork 2 Flame Wheel. These have nothing to do with the challenge, I just thought they were kinda cool. Anyways, now it's time to talk about our second category of attacks, Transformations. His first and probably most popular transformation is his Goat Transformation. During this attack, he extends both his arms off screen, and later they come back attempting to crush the player. And in order to dodge this attack, we need to have a well-timed double jump. One cool thing about this attack is, in the earlier stages of this game, you were actually able to duck underneath this. Obviously, you can't do that anymore, but, you know, it's still cool. The main way I dodged this attack is I would wait for his arms to just go off screen. And once that happens, it takes about 15 frames for the arms to completely cover the entire floor. 
So I would wait for the arms to go off screen, then double jump and dash. This would perfectly dodge the attack pretty much every single time. Heading on to the next attack in this category, we're talking about the spider transformation. This attack is basically the fire wheel attack of this category, meaning it sucks complete total ass. For this transformation, he obviously turns into a spider, and to attack us, he jumps off screen before slamming down towards the player. The problem with this is, sometimes he doesn't go to the player's exact location, sometimes he just goes wherever he wants. And also, what makes this attack even worse, he usually slams down three times, but occasionally he can slam down four or even five different times. So not only do we not know where he's gonna attack, but we also don't know how many times he is going to attack. Literally, my best strategy for avoiding this attack was running in whatever direction felt best and hoping he didn't hit me. But now that I've proven that I'm truly a master at dodging these attacks, it's time to talk about his third and final transformation, the Serpent. Much like the last category, this third attack is very, very easy. Before he actually does the attack, he can be seen in the background extending his neck off screen. And a while later, he'll come out as a serpent from the left or right side, forcing the player into the corner. This attack on its own isn't a big deal, the only thing we have to worry about is minions literally spawning on top of us and forcing us to take damage. The one thing I did was watch the background to see if any minions were coming to my side, and if one was, I would try and time my jump to make sure I didn't get hit. Another cool thing you can do to dodge this attack is you can actually crouch underneath the arches in the serpent. For some reason, he doesn't have a hitbox there, and as long as you stay crouched, it's physically impossible for him to actually hit you. One final thing I do want to mention about these attacks is they all have a specific time when they're supposed to happen. The head attack represents the spider transformation, the clap attack represents the goat transformation, and the pitchfork attack is the pitchfork attacks. The Serpent transformation basically just takes an attack spot whenever it wants, and it's represented by the Dragon Head attack right here. But if you're wondering, this phase takes like 8 minutes, so no, I did not keep track of this. But after using an entire year's supply of roundabout bullets, we finally finish off this phase and engage the animation for phase 2. Heading into the second phase, we actually get some new music, which sounds like I'm having a fucking seizure at the middle school talent show. Regardless of how the music sounds, this phase is not very interesting, although it is really long, having the second highest HP out of any phase with 6300 HP. There's only two attacks that he can actually do, and there's one thing that just happens. The first of his two attacks is his axe attack. He spawns a spiraling axe in the middle of the screen, and all it does is try to hit the player. The good thing is this attack can literally be dodged without moving as long as we're standing on the right side of a platform. The second thing he does is spawn a parryable bomb from either his left or right ear. To deal with this attack, we can easily just parry the bomb to get rid of it completely, but if we can't make it there in time, we can also go to the complete opposite side of where it spawned and we'll be safe from the explosion. And that basically does it for all the attacks in this phase. There's only one other thing that he does, and that's where he drops flaming poker chips. These poker chips fall down from the top of the screen in a pattern that either moves left to right or right to left. All these poker chips do is fall from the ceiling until they run into the stone platforms and get destroyed, and they literally do this for the rest of the boss fight. There's no way to actually get rid of these poker chips until they self-destruct, so we just have to deal with them by switching between platforms making sure we don't get hit. After we finish off that phase, we obviously enter phase 3, and with that we actually lose our far left and far right platforms, so now we only have 3. And also, the devil actually loses all of his attacks, so now he can only summon minions. Obviously, the poker chips are still falling, but now he has the ability to spawn both big and small flying demons. The easiest of these two to deal with is obviously the small demons. Every once in a while, he'll spawn a group of three demons, with each of them having 3.5 HP. And for those of you who are wondering, no this is not a lot of HP, it actually equates to around 3 spread shot bullets, meaning whenever he spawns them, we can just jump up there and mow through them instantly. The large demons on the other hand, have about 14 times that, so that strategy is not going to work for them. The large demons spawn on the left and right side of the screen and continuously shoot skulls at the player. So the best strategy I found was constantly killing any large demons that spawned on the left hand side. I wanted to keep the demon on the right alive because occasionally the skulls can be parryable, meaning I can get some extra cards, and also if we kill them, they're just gonna respawn. So for the entirety of this phase, I would just sit on the left side killing any large demons, and if I saw him spawning small demons, I would jump up and kill them with my spread shot. 
This third phase, in my opinion, is definitely the hardest phase, just because of how much stuff is happening. But once we take out all of his 5,250 HP, we head on to his final phase. In this phase, he literally only has one attack, and that's where he cries like a little bitch boy because I'm about to beat him even though he's 10 times stronger than me. And to pair up with this, the chips are still falling, and we only have one platform left. So what you're supposed to do, since the tiers are parryable, you're supposed to jump off the platform, parry, and then jump back on to avoid the chip. But as we all know, Miss Chalice is an absolute cheat code, and we can just use her double jump instead of parrying. So this super scary final phase is just me using my roundabout to shoot him and jumping. And to make all of this even better, for this phase he only has 2100 HP, which isn't a lot for this challenge, but normally that is a lot. It is literally the same amount of HP as a regular devil fight on expert mode, and that's all for just this one phase. I know what's gonna happen. Maybe. Yeah. Are we? Of course we are. Ladies and gentlemen. Bada bing bada boom. Now that we've defeated King Dice and the Devil, we are completely finished with Inkwell Head but we are nowhere near the end of this challenge because it's time for Inkwell Isle 4. And going in order of the streams, we're gonna start off Inkwell Isle 4 with an absolute bomb because we are fighting one of the hardest DLC bosses, Glumstone the Giant. That's right, we have finally made it to the DLC, but we are not allowed to celebrate because we are facing a boss that constantly gives me problem in these challenges, and that's of course, Creepy Uncle Glumstone. The first phase of this boss fight is absolutely insane. Not only does he attack, but he also spawns minions, and there's stuff that we have to worry about in the map itself. First, I'm going to be talking about his three attacks in this phase, starting with his bear attack, or as I like to call it, the a cat. This attack is very simple, he pulls this bear from a very suspicious place and drags it from the left side to the right side of the screen. On expert mode, he drags this bear up to the fourth pillar and it forces us to go close to Glumstone. But you obviously know I'm not going to dodge this attack normally because I of course have a cheese strat. Despite Glumstone pulling the bear all the way to the fourth platform, you can actually survive there if you stand on the very right side of the platform. This actually works out perfectly because throughout the fight, he destroys three of the platforms and this fifth one is commonly destroyed. So, utilizing some janky hitboxes, we can render this attack pretty much completely useless. The second attack on the other hand is a bit different. During this attack, he opens his mouth where there's two children inside cooking meth. These kids obviously got directions from a Discord server because we begin to get shot by sentient clouds of gas. Some of these gas clouds can be parryable, and all they do is travel in a straight line until they make it off screen. Sadly, for this attack, I don't have any cheese strategies, but that's just because it's basic projectile dodging. I just used Miss Chalice's double jump and dash parry and tried my best not to take any stupid damage. His third and final attack is definitely his most annoying attack, and the one that I have the biggest problem with dodging. The third attack is his goose attack. He holds up a sign that says geese crossing and a ton of geese fly overhead and if we run into any of them, we take damage. So we're obviously supposed to dodge this attack by being at the bottom of the screen, but the problem is the platforms we're standing on can move upwards into the geese. So the way I would dodge this attack is I would crouch on the platform that I'm currently on until I saw it move upwards. And once it did start to move, I would immediately invincibility roll off of it to make sure I didn't move up into the geese. There is another obvious way of dodging this, and it's just to go to the bottom of the map. But the problem is, the bottom of the map literally has spikes on it. These spikes are actually gnomes, and they come out of the ground once the players walked over top of them. So we can go to the bottom of the map as long as we're walking in a straight line and avoid overlapping any gnomes that are already out of the ground. But if I'm being completely honest, I'm not very good at that part, so I just tried my best to never touch the ground at all, because if I did, I knew I would probably do something stupid. And with all that said, there's only one more thing to talk about, and that's the minions he spawns in this phase. Throughout this phase, he spawns two different minions, blue gnomes and cyan gnomes. 
The cyan gnomes can be seen trying to climb up the side of the platform, and once they make it to the top, they try and bonk the ever-loving sh** out of the player. Although, both of these gnomes really do not have that much HP, and they get killed by a singular converge shot, so they're really easy to deal with. The blue gnomes get spawned at the bottom of the map and shoot out a golden cloud either directly up in the air or diagonally. These gnomes can actually stack up very quickly and become a serious problem, but again, we have the converge shot, so all we have to do is shoot a few bullets and all of them are dead. So this phase is very busy, and it takes quite a while with him having 5100 HP, but this phase is pretty much just using my roundabout shot and jumping around until there's too many minions, and then I use my converge shot. And once we finish this phase, we move on to one of the hardest phases in this entire video. Phase 2, or as I like to call it, Gnome ha has one attack and a metric sh ton of minions. This phase has the most HP out of the entire boss fight with 6,630, and we have the job of defeating his hand puppets. The hand puppets basically just play ping pong with a bag of coins, and if that bag hits us, then we take damage. And this attack does look really hard to dodge, but depending on where the hand puppets are, the bag will move in the exact same direction every single time. If you look on screen right now, this is literally every single combination that the hand puppets can be in. Both of them have the ability to move within three different levels, the bottom, which is the lowest, the middle, which is the middle, and the top, which is the highest. And from these positions, they throw the bag of coins to the opposite hand puppet. And again, each position has their own spot where the bag lands, but this is the exact same every single time. On screen right now, you can see the path that the bag takes in every single position. And to have any hope of doing this phase in this challenge, I needed to pretty much know every single one of these. And get this, that's not even the worst part of the boss fight because he still spawns minions, and when I say he spawns minions, I mean about 18 per second. The minions will first appear as little bumps in the ground, then they'll jump out and try to attack the player. This is not great, but it's bearable. We have the converge shot, meaning we can take out a lot of minions really, really fast. But my one complaint is, sometimes these gnomes are literally invisible. Take a look at this screenshot right now and guess where the gnome is going to jump out of. And no, I'm not talking about that cyan one right there. Do you have your guess? Okay, let's take a look at the clip and see if you're right. Did you get it right? Hopefully not, because that gnome is absolute bullshit. So this phase has a lot of HP and takes forever. It has a super confusing attack, a ton of minions, and we have to play Schrodinger's gnome to make sure we don't take damage. And no, I don't really have a strategy, it's just about learning the attacks as best I can, using my converge shot and praying. And once we've done that for about 5 minutes straight, we finish one of my most hated phases in this entire game, and we're on to phase 3. To enter phase 3, we literally need to get eaten, and now we're in Glumstone's stomach. This phase has 5270 HP, and in my opinion, it's his easiest phase. For this phase, he only spawns one type of minion and does one attack. The minions are small scuba diving gnomes that appear on the left and right side and shoot darts out at the player. Sometimes these darts can be parryable, and all they do is travel in a straight line. The one attack he does is he shoots out a bone or a chicken leg, and it flies through the air until it comes in contact with one of the platforms. Once that happens, the platform will sink and only come back once we parried some cowbells. But where are the cowbells? They're actually hidden inside one of the five platforms and only show up once that platform has been hit by a bone or chicken leg. So this entire phase is pretty much just doing parkour between platforms until we can parry the cowbells. And while we're doing that, we're constantly shooting our roundabout up at Glumstone's stomach ulcer because that's how he takes damage. So there we go. That's the third phase. I, I told you it was easy. Yeah, baby. What? As an <laughs> I haven't stroke. Whatever, S rank, yay. That's right, we're fighting the boss with the best DLC music, and that's of course the Moonshine Mob. This is technically our first four-phase boss fight of the video, and of course, we're starting with phase one, which is Charlie Left Legs. This first phase has the most attacks and minions in the entire boss fight, with three different attacks and two different minions. The two minions in this phase aren't very interesting, but they are here, the first of these minions being the ant 
police officer guys. The ants can appear in any of these six locations, and they actually shoot pesticides at Charlie Left Legs. Sometimes these pesticide clouds can be parryable, and obviously if we run into them, we're gonna take damage. But if Charlie Left Legs, the boss, runs into them as well, he also takes 10 damage. Which isn't a lot, considering that he has 4,950 HP, but you know, it's cool. The second minions that get spawned are actually spawned during an attack, so they're technically in both categories. So he whips out his super cool telephone and either says this, or this. Both are not English, but the second one sounds like get to the bathroom, and that's the only way I can hear it. Once he sums up his fly mobsters, they appear in pairs on each level of the stage. So two at the top, two at the middle, and two at the bottom, and all they do is move either left or right until they get off screen. These minions can easily be killed by a singular roundabout shot, but one cool thing about them is you can actually crouch underneath them, so you don't have to kill them, but you probably should. The next attack that he does technically also summons a minion, but not really. For this attack, he rolls up with his caterpillar friend and shoves his foot way up into the caterpillar's colon, and this just sends the caterpillar flying around like a DVD logo until we kill him. The caterpillar only takes around 3 roundabout shots to kill, and since I'm constantly shooting my roundabout shot, it only takes a few seconds for him to run into 3 bullets and die. And if we're being completely honest, it's not that hard to avoid a giant bright green caterpillar that's flying around the screen, so... I didn't really worry when he started to do this attack, cause I knew the caterpillar was gonna die anyways. For the final attack of this phase, it's of course a good one because he spawns a ton of bombs. He pulls out a remote and presses a button which drops a ton of hanging bombs from the ceiling. These bombs blow up when the player walks past them, and not only do they do damage to the player, but they also do damage to minions and the boss himself. Once again, it only does around 20 damage, so it will insta-kill minions, but it's not going to do anything to the boss. One thing that we do always have to keep track of is there can only be 9 bombs on the screen at a time, and once we pass that mark, all of them will explode. So guess what, we get to use more of Miss Chalice's broken mobility to run past and blow up all of these bombs. Once we deal enough damage, Charlie Left Legs decides to go full Kratos mode and take a leap of faith off the very high ledge we're standing on, and now we're in Phase 2. We're in luck because I'm playing as Miss Chalice, so Phase 2 is literally the easiest in the game. It's actually so easy, in fact, that I do not even have to move. In this phase, there is literally only one thing we care about. There are two minions in this fight, but they don't do anything. The two minions are again, the ant police officers, and some barrels with legs. Both of these minions just walk to the left or right in a straight line, either on the top platform or the bottom platform. And as you can see, throughout this entire phase, I never touch either of those platforms a single time. So what's the one thing we care about? That gramophone in the middle spitting out some f deadly tunes. As you can see, the gramophone shoots out two pairs of three rays, with one of the rays moving clockwise and the other moving counterclockwise. After a certain amount of time, all the rays in one pair will turn yellow and then turn red, and when they're red, they can deal damage. So you're supposed to move in a circular pattern to match the rotation of the rays, or, you know, you could just use an invincibility roll. This strategy actually ends up working perfectly. We can just invincibility roll into the edge of the map to make sure we don't go anywhere. And the thing we're supposed to be killing, the lightning bug, she actually dances left and right across the middle platform, meaning if we shoot our roundabout, it's gonna come back and hit her. The lightning bug has the same amount of HP as Charlie left legs with 4,950 HP. So I literally stood in place, invincibility rolling into a corner for three minutes, and that's the entire phase. Once we do enough damage, we hit her with a 1-2 combo and she falls on her ass. And now we're on to the hardest phase of this boss fight, the Anteater phase. Initially, this phase doesn't seem that bad. He only has 3,930 HP and he really only does one attack. The thing we have to defeat in this phase is an Anteater, and for him to attack, he shoots his snout out from these six places. And from these six bots, he'll either stick out his snout, stick out his snout and shoot his tongue out, or fully shoot his tongue out and pick up a bug ball. When he shoots off one of these bug balls, they bounce around similar to the green caterpillar in phase 1. But the problem is, the only way we deal damage is if we hit him in his snout, and his snout only appears for a few seconds while he's attacking. So if we were to use the roundabout in this phase, it would take forever, because we would constantly be chasing around his snout trying to shoot him. And not to mention, but the bug balls are also super hard to hit with the roundabout. So what exactly are we supposed to do for this phase? We're gonna use the motherfucking charge shot, baby. 
The charge shot is a single shot weapon, and if we tap the shoot button, it shoots out this little puny projectile that does around 6 damage. But if we hold down the shoot button for a few seconds, we will fully charge the charge shot, and if we hit something with it, it's gonna do 46 damage. This is the most damage one shot can do in the entire game, and it's so strong that it actually one shots the bug balls. So now we can use the charge shot to accurately shoot super strong bullets at both the bug balls and his snout. Now we barely have anything to worry about in this phase, we just have to make sure we're accurately shooting our charge shot, and that's it. One final thing I did in this phase was I pretty much always stayed on the bottom level of the map. This was because if he ever fully extended his tongue in my direction, I could again use Miss Chalice's overpowered dash parry to dash straight into his tongue. And since his tongue is pink, that means it's parryable, so it's as simple as just dashing into his tongue and jumping over it. And there we go, I cheesed another phase and we're basically done with this boss fight. The fourth phase of this boss fight isn't really a phase, it's just like a funny haha meme joke. In the original game, this phase only has 72 HP, and like I said, it's just there to make you think you beat the boss because it said knockout, but really, there's one final phase and then you die. This phase only has 720 HP, and he does one attack, it's a snail, and he shoots sound waves at you, and sometimes they can be parryable. That's it. So yeah, I walked back and forth and shot him with about 16 charge shots, and that's the, that's the fight. Holy f**k, they're actually so fast. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> no, Geo changed it because it's loud. Oh yeah, look at those member emotes. Absolutely beautiful. This boss, who is known as the Knight, is actually our first King's Leap boss fight of the challenge, and if you looked at the intro card, we're not allowed to use any weapons or supers in this entire boss fight. For anybody who's wondering why this was our first King's Leap boss fight instead of the pawns, sadly, we can't actually mod the pawns because they can only be hit a single time, meaning if we were to give the pawns 10 times HP, they would still only be able to be parried once, and we would just make the boss fight impossible. So we're skipping that one, we're fighting the knight, that's all you need to know. Technically, these guys aren't even boss fights, they're not even required to beat the game, all they do is give you coins, and I don't even need coins, because I'm just gonna fucking use Ms. Chalice. But I'm still gonna beat every single one of them, just because I can. The way these boss fights work are basically the exact same as every other boss fight. They have a certain set of attacks that they do throughout the boss fight, and we have to deal enough damage to actually kill them. But in the King's Leap boss fights, as I mentioned earlier, we do not get any weapons or supers to use, and the way we deal damage is through parries. Regardless of what champion we're facing, we will always deal 10 damage per parry, so in this boss fight, the knight has 2000 HP, meaning yes, we have to parry this horse 200 times. The knight's first attack is his quickest and most frequent attack, and that's his upward thrust. He drops his sword down to the ground and quickly swings it up trying to hit the player, and after this, he gives about 16 frames of downtime. If you time it right, you have the chance for one quick parry before he brings his sword back up and you can no longer parry him. Although, I would only parry this attack during the beginning of the boss fight just because I know how risky it was and I did not want to die. His second attack is his wild swing, where he flips up his visor then does a massive 180 degree sword swing before passing out for 40 frames. The animation for this attack is very clear, so you know when he's doing it every single time, and all you have to do is back up to avoid the initial swing, and you can get two extremely easy parries. For his third and final attack, we have his sword dash. He pulls his sword back and points it horizontally at the player before dashing all the way across the other side of the screen. This was definitely my favorite attack, because not only could we get one parry while he was dashing across, but we could get an additional two parries during his downtime. And that does it for the entirety of this fight. There isn't any cheese in this fight that I can do, and the worst part is, I can't even use Miss Chalice's second super art, because super arts aren't allowed. So I just have to slap the sh** out of this horse for about 5 minutes straight, and I can only take 4 hits of damage.
Finally, bro. Oh my god. I sweat every single liquid in my person out of my hands. They're all gone. Okay, I know that intro card was kind of boring because it sounded like the same music, but it wasn't. It was the Bishop version of the song, which is like the exact same. Regardless of the music lore, we're on to our next boss fight, which is another King's Leap boss fight. We're fighting the Bishop. I'm actually quite a big fan of this boss fight, and I think it's pretty cool. In this fight, he has one attack where he shoots bells at us, but that, that's not the cool part. What's actually cool is how we damage him. For a majority of the fight, and as you can see right now, nothing on our screen, including him, is parryable. But if you look in the background, there's 10 floating candles, and some of them are on fire. You've probably figured this out by now, but if we walk past the candles that are on fire, we'll actually distinguish them, and if we distinguish every single candle, the bishop's head becomes pink, giving us the opportunity to parry him. So who's ready for my new favorite game? Run around for 10 minutes distinguishing candles just so I can kill a f chess piece that means absolutely nothing to the challenge. This boss does technically have phases where once we've dealt enough damage, the candles appear in different patterns, with the final pattern being all of them lit up. But if we're being honest, that doesn't really matter. It's still running around trying to blow out candles. If you really do care, here's every single candle pattern in the entire boss fight. But like I said, it's literally just blowing out candles for 10 minutes. But it's still fun. That's f go. Ah. That's right, it's time to fight Mr. Freeze, Grandpa, man. We're back to fighting regular bosses with regular weapons, and finally, Miss Chalice's second super art. Starting off this fight, we can very clearly see Mortimer Freeze hanging his ass from the ceiling, and this is what we call Phase 1. Phase 1 has a very relaxing 2780 HP, as well as 3 attacks with one of the attack spawning minions. His minion attack is where he opens up the bottom part of his shirt and releases four icicle children. Don't ask me why they're in there, I don't know, but after they're shot out from under his shirt, they get stuck into the ground and after a few seconds, they get unstuck and will either walk to the left or to the right until they get off screen. These children can actually be very hard to dodge because the angle they get shot out at is basically completely random and they can also be stuck in the ground while he's doing a different attack. Speaking of other attacks, his second attack is where he tries to dye my hair blue and convert me into believing in astrology. He pulls out a crystal ball and starts shooting cards at my current position, and some of these cards can be parryable. This attack pairs well with the icicle minions if they're already on screen, because when I try to jump to avoid the icicle minions, I end up jumping into a card. For the final attack in this phase, this old man pulls a whale from his hat and tries to hit me with it. Obviously, when he slams the whale into the ground, if I'm underneath it, I'm gonna take damage, but one cool thing is, if the icicle minions are underneath it, they will also take damage and die. So, we're just hanging out with Grandpa and his icicle children, and this entire phase is just me jumping at him with my spread shot, so I'm dealing damage. This phase is pretty difficult, but it's only because there's a lot of stuff on screen, and a lot of that stuff can deal damage. But once we've gotten rid of all of his HP, he gets eaten by a mutant snowman, and now we're in Phase 2. Phase 2 is very similar to Phase 1. He technically has three attacks with one of these attacks spawning minions. The only difference is this phase has like three times the amount of HP with 7,770. Apparently the snowman's name in this phase is Jupiter, which just makes the astrology joke a bit funnier. For his first attack, I would personally call it the easiest, and that's his spike attack. He gets mad because I made fun of him and slams both his hands into the ground, creating a shockwave of 7 spikes. These spikes kind of act like a wave and cover the entire ground, but again, I'm playing as Miss Chalice, meaning I can just jump over them. I'm sure this attack is difficult if I was playing as Cuphead, but I'm not, and I never will, so double jumping it is. His second attack can be dodged by literally doing the exact same thing. Actually, this isn't even an attack really, it's mainly just for movement. But this attack is just him rolling across the floor, occasionally he can do a double roll or even a jump. Luckily these movements are very clearly animated, if he's gonna roll he stretches his arms out and leans back. 
and if he's gonna jump, he lifts himself off the ground before bouncing over us. So if we see him starting the animation for a roll, we're gonna step back and get ready to jump, and if he starts to jump, we're just gonna stand there. His third attack is just a bunch of random bullshit. He becomes a fridge and shoots ice cubes at us that explode, and he also releases popsicles which fly at us. The ice cubes he shoots out always land at our current location, and there's three types of them. The small ice cubes, which he never shoots out, the medium ice cubes, which he does shoot out, and once they hit the ground, they turn into the small ice cubes, and the large ice cubes, which also get shot out, and when they hit the ground, they turn into medium ice cubes, which then turn into small ice cubes. I'm pretty sure I said the word ice cube about 18,000 times in that one sentence, but it was necessary. Seeing as how the ice cubes always landed at my current position, I would stand a decent distance away from him, but make sure I could still hit him with my spread shot. And once he started shooting ice cubes, I would slowly move in towards him to make sure I wasn't getting hit by any ice cubes, but I was still dealing damage with my spread shot. Like I said, popsicles get released during this attack, and they slowly swoop down in a U shape throughout the entire fight. One cool thing about this is, the popsicles coming out from the fridge actually do have a hitbox, and if we kill some of them, that will reduce the amount that come down from the ceiling. If we were playing as Cuphead, we could use something like his Super Art 1 and kill all the minions before they even had the chance to attack us. Obviously, we can't do anything like that right now, but if I saw him doing that attack, I would always make sure to put my spread shot up there to see if I could get some easy kills. Once we deal enough damage, he f implodes, and we get to ascend into Phase 3, where he's now a snowflake. Phase 3 is definitely my favorite phase of this boss fight. We parkour between 5 spinning platforms for the entire fight, while dodging Mortimer Freeze's attacks that come from the left or right. HP and attack wise, this phase is basically the exact same as Phase 2. There's 3 attacks, although none of them spawn minions, and he also has 7950 HP. Starting off again with the easiest attack is this one. He shoots his eyeball out from his mouth, and it moves in a backward C pattern while exploding into five vertical walls. Obviously, if we run into either the eyeball or the wall itself, we're gonna take damage, and you might be looking at it and wondering, how is this attack easy at all? Did you forget? I'm playing as Miss Chalice. I'm gonna cheese it, of course. By utilizing Miss Chalice's double jump and dash, we can temporarily make it to a spot where neither the eyeball nor its walls can even hit us. If we time it right and jump off the highest platforms, we can stall in the air long enough for the eyeball to just go past us, and we can just dash back onto the platforms. So, there we go. We cheesed another attack. Let's go. Sadly, we have no cheese for his second attack, but his second attack is easy anyways, so we don't even need cheese. For this attack, he becomes an ice cream man because he wasn't EDP enough, and spawns five ice cream cones kind of in a star pattern, and they all shoot off in a straight line. Once the ice cream cone spawned, I would always make sure I was on the highest platform at all times, because that meant I only had to worry about the bottom ice cream cone. This obviously depended on what pattern we got, but most of the time they would spawn with two ice cream cones at the top, two at the middle, and one at the bottom, meaning the two at the top and the two at the middle would already move past us since we're already at the top position, and the only one we had to worry about was the bottom one. For his third attack, it's real interesting. He sticks his hands out and throws buckets at us. Every single time he did this attack, we were guaranteed to have one of the buckets be parryable. And these buckets travel to the opposite side of the screen, and once they reach there, they blow up into three projectiles, with one of the projectiles shooting straight off, and the other two shooting at an angle. Obviously, whenever he did this attack, I would try my best to parry the pink bucket, because that just meant that there was less projectile shooting at me. But if I somehow missed it, I would do the same thing as I did last attack and go up to the highest platform. The reason for going up top is, once the buckets blew up into all the projectiles, it would kind of create a tunnel like you're seeing on screen. And as you can see, that tunnel's focusing in right towards the highest platform. So, if I was standing up there, I could basically just walk in a straight line and avoid all projectiles. So there we go, no need for bucket cheese, I can just walk in a straight line and shoot thousands of roundabout bullets at this snowflake. I'll trust- no. Yay. <laughs> 19 minutes! Sorry, I accidentally skipped the timer. I apologize. I made a severe and continuous lapse of my judgment.
That's right, we're fighting Howling Aces, meaning it's time for one of the easiest bosses in this video and a lot of furry jokes. If you saw in the intro card, this is literally the first boss fight in this entire video where I'm not using the roundabout shot. But I replaced it with something you could argue is even better, the crack shot. For the first phase of this fight, we're fighting this steroid dog, also known as Fighter Pilot Bulldog, and he has a fair bit of health with 6,080. Fighter Pilot Bulldog has two attacks throughout this entire phase, as well as a little surprise that comes in once we've dealt enough damage. The first attack he does in this phase is he pulls out a cat from somewhere and makes it vomit balls. Nope, that's just... Yeah, no. The first attack he does in this phase is he goes over and finds his friend, the cat, and holds him like a rocket launcher and shoots yarn. This attack is excruciatingly hard to dodge. To dodge this attack, we need to crouch. The second attack he does is he floats down using his hat as a parachute and then shoots three arm tattoos at us. I really only have one problem with this attack. Looking at him right now, you can clearly see there's a tattoo on his right arm. But when he goes to the right side, how the fuck does he have a tattoo on his left arm? Every single time he does this attack, there's a guaranteed chance of having either one or two of the tattoos being parryable. And once more, I'm playing as Miss Chalice, which means I have a dash parry, so these are like a hundred times easier to parry. With all that said about these two attacks, it's time to talk about the super secret surprise in this phase. Can you guess what it is? Hopefully not, because then it wouldn't be a surprise anymore. It's a, it's a fire hydrant. Once we've dealt enough damage, there's a super floppy airplane that appears in the background that wiggles across screen. This wiggly airplane shoots off a bunch of fire hydrants, which are actually missiles, so now we get to deal with a constant barrage of homing fire hydrant missiles. This was one of the main reasons why I chose the crack shot for this fight, because the only way to combat aimbot missiles is with aimbot bullets. And one final thing you probably noticed about this phase, yes, this dog did indeed force his four children into the storage compartments of his airplane. The four kids pop out randomly and throw three tennis balls, which don't really do much other than just be annoying. The tennis balls are a really good combination with the yarn attack because we're stuck in a crouch position, so if a tennis ball happens to come and hit us, we can't do anything about it. Regardless of all the tennis ball furry madness, once we've dealt enough damage, the plane literally blows up and ejects the four kids out of it. But our friend fighter pilot Bulldog is not so lucky because instead of his kids coming to check on him after he blew up and fell about 500 feet, they want to fight us and now we're in phase 2. This phase is really simple, but honestly, it's kind of cool. As you can see, we're now fighting the four dogs who are spinning in a circle. Each dog has their own hitbox and 680 HP, creating a total of 2720 HP. All four dogs share the exact same attack, and the game randomly chooses which dog gets to attack because they're only allowed to attack one at a time. When one of the dogs is chosen, they shoot out a letter that spins around to spell out either the word wow or bow, and this is the attack they do for literally the entire phase. One cool thing about phase 2 is there's actually something you can do to unlock a secret phase. After you've dealt enough damage to one of the dogs, they start to give off grey smoke, and if you do that to every single one of the dogs without killing any of them, you enter the secret phase. It's obvious that I didn't do the secret phase for this challenge. Number one, I don't like it, and number two, it's not necessary, but it's cool anyways. After completely overusing my totally fair aimbot weapon, we finish this phase in about two minutes, and it's time to go to everybody's favorite phase. Don't ask why, though. Please, please don't ask. First, I have to explain the main gimmick of this phase. Our screen is literally upside down. Throughout the third phase, the female dog, or Sergeant O'Fara, has two different attacks. One that she does when the screen is normal or upside down, and one that she does when it's sideways on the left or right side. Regardless of what attack she's doing, whenever she finishes an attack, the robot plane will completely rotate our screen by 90 degrees counterclockwise. The best thing about this is, there is no way to stop this. We just have to deal with being discombobulated left, right, and upside down for the entire rest of this boss fight, which is about 8 minutes. And oh yeah, we still have attacks to deal with, because this phase wasn't fun enough. The first attack is her laser attack, and she does this whenever the screen is in its normal position or upside down. Looking at the hands that are currently keeping our screen captive, there are three small light-colored circles on each hand. And from these light circles come out ultra mega death rays. These lasers appear in so many different combinations that it'd be really difficult to show them all. So that's what I'm gonna do. 
On screen right now is literally every single laser combination in this entire fight. And keep in mind, any of these patterns can appear either upside down or right side up. By now, I'm thinking I really should have done the secret phase, because then I could have talked about, like, pineapples. But whatever, we're committed to this phase now, and it's time to talk about the second attack in this phase. This attack is the food bowl attack, and it occurs whenever the screen is tilted either to the left or to the right. Tons of dog food bowls drop from the airplane's eyeballs, with the red food bowls traveling across the screen towards the player's feet, and the yellow dog food bowls traveling just above the player's head. To be completely honest, this entire attack is just turning your head sideways so the screen looks like this, and just dodging it normally. The only other thing I did differently during this attack is, since we're closer to Ophara, I would use my spread shot to deal damage instead of using my crack shot like I did during the last attack. And as I mentioned earlier, after about 8 minutes and the destruction of every single bone in my neck, we finally deplete all of Sergeant Ophara's 7200 HP, and we are now done with this phase and this boss fight. There we go. I got him. Sixteen. It's literally all of them are a guaranteed X ranks, you know what I mean? That's right, we're headed back to King's Leap for our next battle. We're fighting the fourth champion, the Rook. And I don't care what you say, this fight is literally my favorite fight in this entire challenge. Not just this video, this entire challenge. Just to let you know, this is not the actual live stream. I had to redo this fight and the last fight because my mouse was on screen during that time in the live stream. I wanna die. In this fight, the Rook is an executioner, so he sends pink heads towards us that we have to parry back towards him to deal damage. When one of these heads gets parried and hits him, it counts as a parry against the Rook. And since he has 1600 HP, that means we have to hit him with 160 different heads. We do get a damage multiplier if we hit him in the head instead of the body, but that doesn't really matter. All you need to know is we have to hit him a lot. Occasionally, he'll also shoot off non-parryable skulls, and there's also a ton of sparks that come off the sharpener, they travel across the bottom of the screen, and obviously if we run into them we're gonna take damage. But you're probably wondering to yourself, why is this your favorite boss fight? This looks extremely boring. That's because it is. Although, we're still in his first phase, and technically he has three. During the first phase, not many skulls get shot out, and there's also no sparks on the ground. And when we enter the second phase, there's a few more sparks and a few more heads, but nothing really special. But literally everything changes in the third phase because heads get shot out so fast that we can literally f levitate as Miss Chalice. Because when you parry something, not only do you get a little bit of extra height, but you also get given another double jump and another parry. So this means we can literally just float and do the entire rest of this boss fight without even touching the ground. So yeah, I just spent an entire minute of this boss fight embarrassing this man. Once we defeat him and go absolute airplane mode, he's gonna live in constant fear that we're gonna steal his guillotine woman, and that's exactly what I'm gonna do, motherfucker. That's right, it's time for us to kill the queen. Um, that's not what I... okay. This was the second boss that I had to redo, and I was not happy about it, because this boss is nowhere as cool as the last one. Although, the mechanics of this fight are pretty interesting. On the floor, you can see three cannons, with only one of the cannons being parryable at a time. When we do parry the cannon, it shoots out a cannonball in whichever direction it's currently facing, and our job is to directly hit the queen's head with one of these cannonballs. Much like every other champion in the King's Leap, if we manage to hit the Queen with a cannonball, that will deal 10 damage, and since she has 800 HP, that's gonna be 80 different hits. The cool thing about this is, the cannons are constantly moving left and right, so we actually have to aim and line up the shot to make it so that we hit the Queen. Other than the cannons, she does have attacks, but they're just kinda boring. For her first attack, she spawns a wall of three lion statues on either the left or right side, and that wall quickly moves to the opposite side. 
this attack can easily be dodged by just dashing into it because we're obviously playing as Miss Chalice. Her second attack is where she takes out two delicate wig wearing Fabergi eggs that rain down smaller Fabergi eggs. Whatever. She pulls out two fancy eggs, and these eggs vomit out a bunch of fancy egg children, and our job is to just not run into them. I do like this fight, and I do like shooting the cannons, but it just takes way too long to actually kill her with 10x HP because I suck at aiming. We have officially made it to our second to last boss fight, and it's our first major plane boss, it's of course Esther Winchester. Fun fact, this boss fight actually has the most HP for a singular boss in this entire game, with 3200 in the main game, meaning with 10 times HP, Esther Winchester has 32,000 HP. Another important thing about this boss fight is, this is our first boss fight in this video where we did not use Miss Chalice. For this fight, the charm I ended up using was actually the Heart Ring. The Heart Ring is a pretty simple charm. With it equipped, we get awarded an additional hit point for our first, third, and sixth parry of the fight. So since the Heart Ring makes us play as Cuphead, we start this fight with 3 HP, and if we manage to get 6 parries throughout this fight, we will have a total of 6 HP. This is actually very important, because if you remember from the King Dice fight, we cannot use Miss Chalice's second super art in plane bosses. So any damage we take during this boss will be permanent, and it will stick with us for the rest of the boss fight. Speaking of the rest of the boss fight, it's time to talk about what Esther actually does in Phase 1. Esther sticks her head out from both the top and bottom doorway of the saloon, and this is what we're supposed to shoot to deal damage. And while she does this, she also attacks us directly with two different attacks, and spawns two different minions. The two minions are both birds, one of them's a vulture that flies across the top of the screen and drops down a stick of dynamite. On expert mode, when the dynamite comes in contact with the ground, it blows up into a wave of four projectiles and then a wave of three. The other minion that gets spawned is a flying horse that basically flies wherever it wants, and it shoots a cactus ball at the player, and sometimes this ball is parryable. Unlike the vulture, this flying horse is killable, making it easier to deal with, but most of the time I would just let them shoot at me because it gave me a chance to get more parries. Overall, these minions don't need a super secret strategy to avoid them, they're just there to be annoying and shoot random bullshit projectiles at me. Much like the minions, the two attacks that Esther does in this phase aren't anything special. Her first attack she does is her lasso attack, where she throws out a lasso and pulls in a massive cactus that takes up about half the screen. This is definitely the easier of the two attacks to dodge, because depending on which doorway she comes out of is which part of the screen we should not be on. So if she's at the bottom and you see her throw her lasso, that means that there's going to be a massive cactus there in a few seconds, so get out of the way. Her second attack is pretty weird. She pulls out two bottles of snake oil and shoots snakes at us that are made out of oil. She always shoots off a pair of snakes, with these two snakes moving at the exact same speed, but with one a little bit lower than the other. So, since these snakes are always shot towards our current position, we always have a gap in between the two snakes to perfectly dodge this attack every single time. And this means, to dodge this super complex attack, we need to stand still. And that basically does it for this phase. Since this phase is so short, only having 5760 HP, which is nothing compared to the next phases, all we do is try our best to avoid any stupid damage, and we also try to get as many parries as we can to try and have 6 HP going into phase 2. Speaking of the second phase, it's the phase with the most HP in this entire boss fight with 9600 HP. Because of the DLC no moving challenge, I know this phase better than the back of my hand. I know it better than my reflection. This phase is me. In this phase, she only has two attacks, and all she does is rotate between these two attacks forever. The first attack she does is her vacuum attack, or as you may know it, the big suck. That sounds weird for anybody who doesn't know what I'm talking about. During this attack, she pulls out a vacuum and starts pulling in random objects from off screen, including the player. So basically our job is to just look behind us and make sure we don't go crashing into something. Her second attack is where she shoots out vaults from her vacuum cleaner, and when these vaults come in contact with the ground, they blow up into a singular projectile that shoots towards the player. These vaults actually fall in a pattern switching between left and right, so all we have to do is go left and right opposite to the vaults and watch out for projectiles, and it's as simple as that. So now it's sausage time. 
why can't I just say normal stuff? This phase also has a lot of HP. It has 8,000 HP in total, which is ridiculous. In this phase, there's technically only one attack that can happen, as well as one invincible minion. The minions that get spawned are apparently beans in a can. I always thought they were sausage links, but apparently not. And randomly, a chain of beans will shoot out from the top of the can. So not only do we have to pay attention to where the minions are so we don't run into them, but we also have to pay attention to where they're facing. As for what attack Esther does in this phase, she shoots looping stakes at us with the occasional stake being parryable. The stake always flies in our current direction and is kind of annoying to dodge especially since it spirals, but considering the fact that we're already against the back of the screen to dodge the minions, this isn't that bad. And with this phase finished, we head into the final phase, which many people consider to be the hardest, of our second final boss. In this phase, she has 8,640 HP and technically one attack. The one attack she has is she shoots out a wave of 5 to 6 chili peppers and sometimes one of them can be parryable. But if you're looking at your screen, the chili peppers are the least of our concern. There's a bigger problem. There's a hole inside that can that Esther's in, and from that hole shoots out two gargantuan sausage links. These two sausage links make a V pattern, and in addition to just being there, they also move up and down crossing paths with each other, basically like a giant weird pair of sausage scissors. So that's great, or it's actually the opposite of great, it's bad, because how are we supposed to get past them if they close in on us? Well, as you can see, the sausage link isn't just a straight wall. Occasionally, there's gaps where there are no sausages. And you guessed it, for the entirety of the rest of this boss battle, we have to fit between the tiny little a gaps between the sausages. There is one cool thing about this phase though, if you try to cheese it by going up to the top where there is no sausage links, she sends a barrage of bean cans from the previous phase to make sure you're not cheating, and that's pretty cool. For this phase, the parries don't really matter, they really only give us super because the heart ring by now has already been all used up. So I have nothing else to do but pray to the Cuphead God who is me, so there is no problem here, we beat the boss. Dude, that is probably the greatest dodging I've ever f done in my entire life. Oh my god! Are you kidding me, bro? Oh my god. I don't care. Close enough to an S rank, I'll take it. Oh, that was amazing. Let's go. If you saw that intro card and said, hmm, why did he choose the chaser for the secondary weapon? I want you to close your mouth and never open it again. I don't care what you have to say, you can say whatever you want in the comments, but the chaser is single-handedly the best shot for pretty much every phase in this fight. As for this phase, this man has an entire essay of attacks to go through, as well as having 6,800 HP. Although first, I'm going to talk about the chaser, because I can tell you're still skeptical. Unless you're not, then I just look like an idiot. Yes, this weapon does technically have the worst damage for a singular bullet in this game, with only 2.85 damage per bullet. But it doesn't actually have the worst DPS, that goes to the uncharged charge shot, which I may or may not have a video of me beating the game with it. Regardless of that, I wanted a shot that I didn't have to worry about aiming, but you might be wondering, why didn't you just use the crack shot? The crack bullets of the crack shot have a very similar DPS to the chaser, with 18 compared to 17.1. But the crack shot is sometimes very inaccurate, it can completely miss its target by a lot. But if we use the weapon above all weapons, the chaser, that doesn't happen. And also I just like using the chaser because people get mad. Other than his cornucopia of attacks, the only other thing we care about in this fight are the flames that sit at the top of the screen. In expert mode, two flames spawn at the top of the screen and they each take turns jumping towards the player. They always attack towards your current position right when they jump, so as long as we're moving around constantly, we shouldn't get hit. But the keyword is shouldn't, because there's still a lot of stuff for us to watch out for. And what exactly are those things? They're the four attacks that he does regardless of whether or not the flames are attacking us. That's right, even while the flames are jumping at us, he can still do an attack, and depending on what attack he does, he could do an additional attack after that while it's still on screen. 
One cool thing about all four of these attacks is they're actually related to an ingredient that got dropped by a previous defeated boss. So for example, the sugar cube attack is a big version of the icy sugar cubes, which is of course dropped by Mortimer Freeze. And other than that, we have the Desert Limes, which are dropped by Astro Winchester, the Distillery Dough, which is dropped by the Moonshine Mob, and the Gnome Berries, which is dropped by Glumstone the Giant. If you're wondering what the Howling Aces drop, they drop the Pineapple Mints, which don't appear in this phase, but they appear later in the boss fight. So now we know what these attacks are and where they come from, but what do they actually do? I'll be talking about each attack in the order that we just mentioned them, meaning we are first talking about the Sugar Cube attack. To start off the attack, he pulls up a very scared looking sugar cube and absolutely pummels him to death with a mallet. In expert mode, he sends 8 floating sugar cubes after us that sort of move in a wave pattern. Some of the sugar cubes can be parryable, and this attack is really just about finding the initial wave pattern so we know where the sugar cubes are gonna be and when. Coming up next is his lime attack, which I know a lot of people don't like, and by a lot of people, I mean everybody. This attack involves him sending 5 lime slices that sort of act as boomerangs and can initially start at the top or bottom of the screen. From there, they'll move all the way to the opposite side of the screen, then change vertical height. So, let's just say we had a lime slice that started on the top left, it's gonna go all the way to the right side, still on the top. And then once it reaches the right side, it's gonna go all the way down to the ground, then go all the way back to the left. One interesting fact about this attack is, many people know that if a lime initially starts in the bottom, regardless of if it comes from the left or right, you can duck underneath it. But what a lot of people don't know is, when you dash, you have the same hitbox as if you're crouched. Meaning, yes, if a lime initially starts in the bottom, we can dash through them. This doesn't do a whole lot for the boss fight, it does help if a lime just suddenly appears in your face. But if I'm being completely honest, I would much rather just crouch or jump over them, cause dashing just feels weird. The third attack we get to talk about is the distillery dough, and I just love this guy. Look at him, he looks so awesome. No! Sadly, my best friend Mr. Happy Face Dough is killed. And he actually gets turned into animal cookies, and these animal cookies are technically minions. On expert mode, this attack spawns 8 different animal cookies, and all they do is bounce up and down towards the player. Luckily, we made the big brain choice and went with a chaser shot, so these guys die really, really fast. So, really, there's no problem with this attack, but I don't think I'll ever get over the pain of losing Mr. Doe. Can we get an F in the comments section for Mr. Doe? If you don't do it, you're just disrespectful. The fourth and final attack is the Gnome Berries, and it's actually the easiest attack to dodge. It's so easy that sometimes I just forget that it's happening. To start the Gnome Berry attack, he weirdly grabs this box of berries. I don't I don't know how I feel about that. Is that gonna get me demonetized? Well, there goes my f***ing YouTube channel. Anyways, on expert mode, this attack summons 16 gnome berries that fall from the sky. As you can see, it's really easy to just completely forget about this attack. They kind of blend into the background, and sometimes I just randomly run into one. So, this is an attack that I really don't care about. There's only two attacks that really matter, and it's the sugar cubes and the limes. As I mentioned, the animal cookies basically just die, and the gnome berries are just there. So this phase is definitely really hard, but after doing it for so long, it's really just doing the exact same movements all over again. After we deal all the damage necessary to remove his 6800 health, we are now on to phase 2. To actually make it to phase 2, he grabs another thing, and this time it's us. Somebody in prison this man. Thank you. Phase 2 is somehow more of a projectile than the first phase. For starters, the flames from the first phase are still here, but this time they're on the floor, although they do the exact same thing. They take turns jumping into the air, but instead of trying to hit us directly like they did in the last phase, in this phase, they try and land at our current position. And that's not all, because in this phase, the pineapple mint attack is finally introduced. This ingredient comes in the form of mint leaves, and he throws from 3 to 5 mint leaves from the ceiling, and they float down until they hit the ground and break. But sadly, this phase is still not over because it had to be silly and fun and quirky and have a completely different gimmick from every other phase in this entire game. Looking at the four corners of our screen, in each of these corners there's a pepper shaker. These pepper shakers do shoot projectiles at us and sometimes they can be parryable, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is, the pepper shakers are the only thing we can damage in this phase. Which means the way we kill Salt Baker is by damaging the Pepper Shakers until they die and go crashing into Salt Baker. 
And if you're wondering, each Pepper Shaker deals 47 damage to Salt Baker, and in this phase, he has 6,290 HP, meaning we have to hit him with 134 Pepper Shakers. There is so much stuff on screen, because the Pepper Shakers are shooting at us, the flames are jumping at us, and leaves are falling on us. And while we're dodging all of this, we still have to make sure we're hitting the Pepper Shakers to deal damage to Salt Baker. So this phase is again sponsored by the Chaser Shot, because it still works perfectly. But once we kill enough Pepper Shakers, we move on to Phase 3, which is basically the game's apology for Phases 1 and 2. This phase only has 1360 HP, and technically only does one attack. Although on Expert Mode, two Saw Blades do move across the bottom of the screen, and obviously if we run into them or touch them at all, we're gonna take damage. I do have to address something in this phase, so you know how in Phase 1 I talk shit about the crack shot for like a full minute? Well, in this phase, I take it back because it works perfectly. Now don't get me wrong, I'm the number one Crackshot fan. It works in every single challenge but this one. Although, in pretty much the entirety of this fight, the Chaser is just better, except for in this phase. In this phase, he summons two twirling clones of himself, which basically just bounce around across the screen like a giant ping pong ball. These guys are bad. No good. I don't like them. And it's only for one reason. Look at their hitbox. That makes absolutely no sense. I took so many hits in this phase just because I'm not practiced in this phase because it never lasts for this long. And also, like I said, the hitbox is dumb, so half the time I would just take stupid hits because I didn't think I was going to get hit in the first place. To dodge literally everything in this phase, all we have to do is walk back and forth and jump over saws. As long as we time it right, we shouldn't get hit by the salt dudes, but sometimes we still do. One really interesting thing about this phase is the Salt Clones only bounce 24 times before they respawn. And this is funny because I totally knew this before going into the fight. It didn't catch me off guard at all. And another thing that was pretty interesting, apparently in this phase on Expert Mode, the gravity actually increases. Obviously, this is only for the bouncing Salt Clones and not for us, but it's still cool. But finally, we are on to the final phase of the final boss in the final video, Phase 4. Phase 4 is actually my favorite phase of this boss fight. I think it's super cool, but a lot of people don't like it, although those people are children. In this phase, two pillars of salt spawn on the left and right, and they basically block us into the middle so that we have to do it normally. Inside these two salt pillars, there's a bunch of pieces of glass that fall down and act as platforms, and we're meant to parkour between these platforms to make sure we don't touch the bottom of the map and take damage. And in order to finish off this phase, Saltbaker's heart is bouncing around the screen, and we need to deal 2,550 damage to kill him. For just a bit of fun, I'm just gonna let you guess, what weapon do you think I used in this phase? If you said anything but the chaser, I'm disappointed. I'm obviously going to use the chaser, because now I can completely focus on doing parkour, and I know all my bullets are hitting him constantly. I'd much rather sacrifice the .9 DPS to make sure that my bullets are hitting him every single time. One thing to note, and I actually use this quite a lot, but Saltbaker's heart is pink, meaning we can parry it. And believe it or not, but the heart actually helps out with parkour way more than you think it would. And that's basically all there is in this phase. It's a super simple phase, but it is really, really fun. So with that said, we finally deal enough damage to complete this boss, and in turn, complete the entirety of this challenge. Ah. It's done, boys. Uh, and only fitting to S rank the final boss. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, hold up. Before I talk about anything else, I just need to say this so that people don't yell at me. For this challenge, I won't be fighting the Angel and Devil secret boss fight, because number one, it's a secret boss fight, and number two, I don't like that fight. And number three, it would just be me using the crack shot in the corner, like you're seeing on screen right now. So, yeah, that's it. Just keep going with the video. So yes, that is the end of the challenge, but we still get to do your favorite part, or your least favorite part, or your average favorite part, the breakdown. 
For those of you who haven't seen a video from this series before, the breakdown is basically where I say which land and plane boss took the longest and has the most HP. For the bosses in Inkwell, there's only two of them, and technically neither of them are plane bosses, so we're only talking about ground bosses. But I'm pretty sure we all know who won in Inkwell because, of course, the boss with the most HP was King Dice with an insane 832,000 HP. And of course, the ground boss in Inkwell that took the longest to defeat was King Dice with an hour, 3 minutes, and 27 seconds. Heading into Inkwell Isle 4, also known as the DLC Island, Let's just get this out of the way, the plane boss with the most HP was the one and only plane boss in this aisle, Esther Winchester, with 32,000 HP. Now, you might not believe this, but the plane boss that took the longest to defeat was Esther Winchester with 16 minutes and 41 seconds. The ground boss in Inkwell Isle 4 that has the most HP is Mortimer Freeze with 18,500 HP. And with another full category sweep, the boss that took the longest to defeat was Mortimer Freeze with 19 minutes and 21 seconds. And for anybody who cares, throughout this entire challenge, the ground boss that had the most HP and took the longest was of course King Dice. And for plain bosses, the most HP goes to Esther Winchester and the longest time taken goes to Wally Warbles with 17 minutes and 28 seconds. So with all that said, we are finally finished with the entirety of this challenge. This challenge literally took 21 hours, 32 minutes, and 29 seconds, although that time isn't very official. I really appreciate all the support throughout this entire challenge, like Cuphead isn't that popular anymore, but all of you still seem to really enjoy the videos, and I really appreciate it. Obviously, videos don't come out as fast as they used to, but that's because they take way longer to make because I try way harder, as you can see by the length of this video. And just as a little surprise for those who stayed to the end, my next video will most likely be a Five Nights at Freddy's fan game video, or maybe even a main game challenge. I have no idea when these videos are coming out, but I have a lot of them filmed, it just takes a really long time to actually edit them, and that's the main problem. But whatever, because that doesn't really matter, so for the final time in this series, thank you all so much for watching this video, if you liked it, please leave a like and consider subscribing, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye.